What I'm not seeing and why I think so many people fail with like just copying old email B2B lead gen and mm. shit like that is that actually you're not copying the content they've also created. You're not online the same way and you actually don't have the context behind what actually makes their business work. Because just by copying an offer doesn't mean you're going to copy the business. People blindly copy at the moment without actually having any context as yep. to why the thing is yeah. working. How and it's hilarious when you see people make the most stupid claims you could possibly imagine yes. because there's actually nothing. And what we're going to do in the growth partner is as we get more evidence, just like take away the bullshit claims and just be honest here is mm -hmm. all the evidence and if you're good at what you do and you're talented and you're a hard worker we will make that, you rich that. people are getting used to these long form sales letters yeah. like this the guys that you're reaching out to are experienced business owners with real businesses yeah like i wouldn't sit there and read an hour long sales letter no i haven't watched any long form content in ages so i don't have time my clients don't even respond to slack messages man like so, so the idea that they're gonna sit through 45 pages I think is absurd, uh, dense stuff. Yeah, you just need, and this is what I said to you on Twitter when you posted your video. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you need a claim, you need to back yeah. up with a silly amount of social proof. Yeah. And then on the sales call, you present the sales letter because everyone uses sales letters in marketing and they get why. And I think for B2C, it works very well. So yeah. for your yes. offer, because people need to go through the seven hours. And those people have the time. Yeah, the there's a difference. So, but for yours, your time with them is on the call. So use the sales letter structure, which by the way, sales is in the name of sales yeah, letter. Yeah. But everyone uses it in marketing, no one uses it in sales. So here's just a counterpoint that I offer, right? A lot of, uh, I, I have my old sales, uh, like my old VSL on my website still, just because yeah. I didn't want to take anything down and leave it blank. So I have my old offer from like November, which uh, my initial offer was just like, I will build your uh, out, like outbound engine. I'll just, I'll figure out what, uh, email templates or, or copy is needed. I'll figure out like the save searches on Apollo, I'll bundle it all together and I'll find you a $3 VA in Philippines to run it on like on autopilot once a month and everything just ends up in your inbox. It's gonna be like 10K and I'll just rip it. I, got, I kind of got that borrowed from uh, cold email wizards because he had, he had run a similar offer before where he's like, you can just set these guys up for three months and they'll pay you 10K. I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. So I, initially I did that, right? And then over time what you learn is like, you can actually raise the value and the price of your offer. And so I've been running the new offer, which you guys know of, but I still have my old DSL on the website, which is a 17 minute long video, uh, still the same flowchart framework. I would say 75% of the time that guys get on a call, they've already done research on me. Like I, 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 it's only on the website. I don't put it anywhere on any other socials or anything like that. They've already done research on me and they almost always address it. They say, yeah, so I, I watched the video. I loved it. I'd love to move forward. Like, they want to buy yeah. the old offer because I haven't gotten around to creating the new VSL yet. So I, I would, I agree. The five minute is probably pretty tasty. That's pretty good. It's, you it's can share it on social. Five minute, but for example, you ever funnel hack Alex Becker back in the day with Pyrex? I haven't, but okay. I know. I, I've probably gone through it, it once. He built his business on like an eight minute VSL. Yeah. And Cole stole his VSL, and he, to be fair, he does credit Becker as well. Yeah. He stole Becker's idea, and like. I think that because of how quick everything is in social media, I think there's going to be a transition. <coughs> it's not necessarily like five minutes, but there's yeah. a sweet spot probably between like the eight and 15 minute mark. Mm -hmm. And then I think that you need to be online in terms of visibility yeah. and content. Yeah. So like the more stuff you pump out, the easier sales is going to be. This is exactly 100%. What you so like when I'm on these calls, the only guys that one call close yeah. are the ones who've seen the content. Hundred <laughs> percent. I think, yes. I think that this is our strategy. I think really? that this is the something that I wanted to start doing is you start taking your case studies and you break them into like a let's say a fifteen minute version of it, like a super in depth part sales letter, part case study. Exactly. A ten a a, a five minute uh, uh, VSL case study where it's like super stripped down, su super punchy, super to the point. The point of the five minute VSL is to get them to watch the 15 minute one. And the 15 minute one just has even yeah. more social proof. And then honestly, I think this, and I, I uh, have said this before, uh, like one minute TikTok VSL, like super, super punchy. Literally just you, like, and, and here, and this is what I mean by it. It is basically a new version, a new video version of what cold email is. Like a cold email is just like a it's small blip. It, it, <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Like, yeah, that's, but, but that's what it is. But but having three versions of the same 
case study yeah, DSL, whatever you want to People want different lengths and formats. Yeah. So, for example, if you look at our sales letter now for the growth partner, it's actually just a case study breakdown of exactly what we've done to go from zero to 100K a month. Mm-hmm. Like, step by step, exactly what it is, me burning down the ages, like everything. Just like super transparently. Because everyone is using marketing tactics for the sake of marketing. So instead of doing that's that, what we did too. Just be honest. With with our with our sales letter. And it prints because it's yes. honest and transparent and you can actually like, evidence it. it. Essentially like what we did, like the one I wrote for Brooke initially that we still use, uh, is just this really transparent, like 50, 60 page yeah. document exactly with some same. sales copy elements yeah, yeah, in it. Yeah. Essentially. That's what it is. And then a power offer at the end, which I'm still going to, to explain the whole thing to you off camera. But <laughs> it's essentially, um, that's what it is, right? So, and, and then you have these, right? This is a game of content, dude. Like, this is what I've always told everybody that I speak with. Like, we built these, right? These emails, these case studies, whatever. And they're there. And then the content like funnels one to here, one yeah. to here, yeah, one yeah, to yeah. there. And then, like, it's just so much content, so much people, so much eyeballs, so much people entering, like, these different, like, webs. Of just exactly. Stuff. So, and that's the thing, like, I don't know about you guys, but when I buy a high ticket mastermind course, yeah. whatever it is, you almost always go down the funnel of content before. Yeah, 100%. But what I'm not seeing, and why I think so many people fail with, like, just copying like cold email B2B lead gen and mm-hmm. shit like that is that actually you're not copying the content they've also created. You're not online the same way. And you actually don't have the context behind what actually makes their business work. So, because just by copying an offer doesn't mean you're gonna copy the business. Yeah, right. And I think this is such an important point and you touched on it as well. It's like people blindly copy at the moment without actually having any context as yep. to why the thing is yeah. working. How it works. They sense. never understand the underpinning mechanism. And it's hilarious when you see people make the most stupid claims you could possibly imagine mm-hmm. yes. because there's actually nothing. And what we're going to do in the growth partner is as we get more evidence, because we're still pretty new, like it, it, it's yeah. been basically not even running <coughs> for you like six months, not even that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's basically just like take away the bullshit claims of like the, the big bold claims and just be completely honest here mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. all the evidence and if you're good at what you do and you're talented and you're a hard worker we that's, will make that, you that's how we marketed from day one like even our main claim is super like reasonable yeah. like take care of month yeah. 24 weeks yeah that's that, ridiculous that like, is like and i think this is what i'm saying about the people we need to go backwards now to go yeah. forward because everyone's Agreed. going from info product so it's like Let's push, 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 push. If you want to learn more about how you could become a growth partner and transition your business, click the link below to book a call directly one-to-one with one of our growth managers who can walk you through how partnering with us could work. Anyways, let's get back to the video. You would probably agree or at least say that the most lucrative partnership that you would have as a growth partner is likely to be six to 12 months. let's say a higher ticket, something like maybe five to 10K plus rev share. If you were to run it over, let's say six to 12 months, basically the valuation of the contract uh, is going to be in the ballpark of let's say 125 to maybe a quarter. Yeah. Right, okay. So, So that's the most lucrative iteration of that contract value, okay? But you are now tied to that person for 12 months. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman that we have previously spoke of has a different and I think interesting model, which I also find appealing, where you basically uh, install uh, a growth engine, whether that's through outbound or paid ads mm-hmm. or whatever it is. Generally, it's, it's probably going to be a variety of different funnel pieces, right, that a lot of these businesses do not have uh, and you're creating assets for them and, and building it out. Uh, and you're just trying to deploy it very quickly. So if you, yeah. if you can deploy it in like, let's say, 14 to 45 days yeah. and you would just charge between 35 to 50K. I've been on many, many sales calls in B2B SaaS. Now, granted, I target funded guys. I target guys that are backed by venture capital. I do that deliberately because I don't want to deal with unqualified buyers. They're not price sensitive at all. If, if I had more case studies showing that my model worked, I could charge significantly more. And what's appealing to me is if I can figure out how to crack and deploy a growth engine, uh, like my, so my claim, 
If, so so my, my claim is that I will give you between five to 10 qualified ads in a growth engine that you can scale by putting in more money, whether that's through email domains and increasing outbound volume or through paid ads. And you will have basically an acquisition channel. You, you probably would be closing at like 20% 20, 20 of these qualified sales calls, right? The implication of the growth engine is that you get to look up in 12 months time, you probably have an eight to $10 million valuation you are what's known as default fundable. And this is where I explain default fundable, which is a term coined by David Sachs, who is one of the original members of PayPal Mafia. And I tell them all this in the sales call. My job is, while I am giving you basically marketing, what I'm really trying to do is give you leverage so that when you sit down with venture capital at your series A, you get to name your price, write it down on a piece of paper, you get what you want, and you've made piles of money. Mm -hmm. For that, I will charge you about 0.325 to 3.25% of the overall enterprise value raise, right? That's a pretty compelling offer. No, Nobody has any resistance with that. The only issue is deploying, is building out the system yeah. in 14 to 45 so, days. So this is where I think the, there's a bit of a fallacy is that firstly, yes, you can get a contract value of 125 to 250K, but like my first growth partner deal was with Jordan and I've made multiple millions. One of your deals with Brooke, you're going to make multiple millions over the next six months. So yes, there is like if you're just charging a set and you don't get performance, I think yeah. 100k is very reasonable. Yeah. If you get performance, there is no limit. I said this earlier. Sure, sure. The second part to that is I think that you're essentially doing a done for you setup. Yeah. Which I think <laughs> is good. I don't think there's a problem with that, but I think that you have to detach what you set up from the results and it's more about the setup itself because you, you go into that more. So to actually get results with what you're setting up, it takes the time and energy to go through and have the holistic view. Mm -hmm. So if you're selling a setup, they need to know that it's a setup rather than you selling the millions because then you are going to have to dive in to get them the result. Right. Rather, <coughs> and, and we've thought about this, but we've, we've kind of talked through this potentially yeah. as, as a, a new iteration of the model. But if you sell and that expectation is to make 10 million or whatever yeah. is an enterprise value, and you just do the setup, you will continually having to do the ads, continue having to do the outbound until you get results. Because we actually switched at one point in FE very early on before we had the team to a done with you. And we don't talk about this tons, but it was a complete disaster because we sold them based on outcomes yeah. and all of them bar one went back to done for you, right. but we charged less for that. Right. And they were nightmares because they wanted results. And as I'd done with you, most businesses can't do it. Agreed. So yep. you hand that off, yeah. they're screwed. They, they just don't know how to do it. Even with good ads and ads have a lifetime on it. Like yeah, I've already made sure. like 200 Twitter ads in two months. You can't do that for 10 clients. No. And you can't do that in 14 days. No. It's not possible. Plus, it's everything that, like the reason why our marketing now works so well is that I've done the ads, I've done the funnel, I've done the VSL, I've done the backend, I've done the setter process, the sales process, and everything in between that, okay? So up until the point they're on a call, I have dialed in every single thing. And when you move the needle in a few different directions across the board, that's when you make millions and millions and just doing a done for you setup, you just give them ads, you just do this. And it actually doesn't create the shareholder value that you think you do. Right. And you will run into problems where if you've got a guarantee, yeah. if you've got this, you will get a bad reputation because they're not getting the results. So, so you then advocate small handful, four, five, seven clients and just go for the big overall yeah. annual contract value. So what I would do for you is that I would genuinely really try and pick the offers that are winners and that you can see a strategy. Okay. And then, yeah, it's like, it's not like a six month because actually the most money, by the way, is when they're printing and you're just getting revenue and revenue and revenue share in like the tank, like the way we position the clients is the 10 K a month you pay us covers the costs. We don't make profit on that. Right. Our goal is to make you a hell of a lot of money so that we make the money as well and we're incentivized on your growth. And that positioning helps us get a lot of deals over the line. That's what I did <laughs> too. Yeah. Like essentially like before I was locked in with Brooke, like that was like the value proposition was something similar in the sense that, yeah, like I'm gonna come in, I'm gonna make you a lot of money, 
And because of that, I'm going to make a lot of money. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and, and essentially it worked really well. Um, but essentially what I would do is I would come in, I would do my process. Like it would usually take two weeks, like just get everything set yeah. up to launch. I would do the launches and then like, it was like a two month agreement. Right. And I would get all that profit share in the meantime. Right. And they would make more money than me essentially because charging them 30%. Um, they, they would make more money than me. They'd be happy. I'd be happy. And then my consulting clients, and then like because I can scale done for you. Like essentially, I would take one or two people done for you, like in one in one to two month spans. Mm -hmm. And then I'll do consulting, in which I would charge like an upfront fee plus a smaller percentage right. uh, mm -hmm. set. And that's that was my plan to make a million dollars, like in a year. So this is something that I like um, with what you do. And I see this offer a lot on Twitter and it doesn't necessarily work for SaaS, unfortunately, but um, I think Devesh does it. There's a couple other guys that you work with people who already have an audience and just monetize yeah. the audience. It's the easiest home run in the world if you're a good marketer. Like it's like 100%. pull an offer, send it. You'll, 100%. you'll make 100K minimum. But, but I'll say this. Uh, no, I'll say this. I'll say this. Even though that was printing me a lot of money, yeah. I still prefer it this way. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's one guy, it's just like it's one thing you gotta focus, you gotta go deep on it. Yeah. yeah. And he becomes like your best friend. Yeah, we, we, we're basically best friends at this yeah. point. Yeah, <laughs> me, like, me, me and Jordan are as well. Like, we're, yeah. we're best friends with business partners. So it's like, I, I tell this story, but like, shit goes wrong in your business. Oh, it does. Like, all the time, shit goes wrong, whether you're the best fucking person in the world. And better entrepreneurs than all of us have failed miserably and had to burn it all to the ground, okay? So shit will go wrong and I'll walk across, we'll go get our coffee. Jordan comes down the street like singing, cheering me up after like this hell of a day. And it's like, there's nothing better about business than doing it with good This is people. very true, yeah. man. Because the feedback loops are much tighter. Like you're talking about shit 24 seven. Yeah. Like no, even, even with the uh, Brooke, like right now we're not having the best month. Yeah. And I mean, our, <laughs> our oh, bad, our sorry. <laughs> what's that, like three, 3.30 maybe? Yeah. Our, our, our bad month is like most people's Fucking best yeah. month. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we're having a little bit of a shaky month. But like, if we again, if we weren't there for yeah, each other, yeah. like, yeah, man, it would be a nightmare. Like, had, you know, I had that with um, like my. He's still like you know one of my best friends back. Uh, but we just had a terrible niche. It was like we we, we were selling to guys just that had no money. But like every day, right? Like eight a.m. He was there. We would just stay there twelve hours a day, working out of my apartment. It, it's probably some of the most fun you'll have. As an yeah, entrepreneur, right? One hundred percent. And I think uh, I think you just have you just have more edges, man, to rely on. Like yeah. when you're working with somebody else who's actually also good. You make That's decisions so so quickly. Yeah, because you, you get the confidence. Super, super you get quickly. the confidence from the other person to be like, yeah, let's do it. And if it messes up, it messes up. But like yeah. when you're on your own, you're like, should I? Should not? And that's why most people buy mentoring and coaching 100%. because they need that like validation. Yep. Like, you don't need the advice. Well, you did to begin with, to be fair. You didn't listen, but <laughs> anyway. But like, you need the validation of your own ideas yeah. or to be told where you're doing something wrong, but a business partner would do that for you. Dude, this is why me and bro, we're not buying anything anymore. Like, we're not yeah, listening we to anybody. Anything. Yeah. Like, we're not listening to anybody anymore. I, I, yeah. Question though, if Moses dropped an offer, would you do it? Huh? If, if Alex and Moses dropped an offer though, would you buy it? Um, like, drops an offer as in... Like a coaching offer. You definitely yeah, definitely. <laughs> but but I mean, but everyone but, else, yeah, everyone, 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 everyone else. Pause. But it's not because I wouldn't necessarily need it. It's just because like, dude, there's just too much goodwill on me yeah, at yeah. this point. Yeah, but that's that's the interesting point. Is that I think that what most people are playing is such a short game that they're. Going this is what we do, man. Like, yeah. and then I think this is why we've been extremely successful. Our entire business is based around goodwill. And you can make the claim, oh, but that's not sus sustainable. It's totally sustainable, like in my opinion, because like you yeah. can, you can always it's give more. more. Sustainable, in my opinion. You can always give more. You know, you yeah. can give more to people always, more. unless you're not doing it. Unless you, yeah. Which again is the biggest problem that I think we have in the space right now is is people coaching and mentoring and that who should not be named. Uh -huh. I think that's the problem with him is he was out the game. He doesn't really understand what you get, works. You now. get out of touch. Yeah, he yeah. is. You lose yeah. the touch, and then you, the advice you give, like, like I'll be honest, like I don't do as much cold email anymore. Like, 
I just don't, I'm, I'm running ads, I'm doing content, that's kind of the space I'm moving into. We have a guy called Blaze, and if you know him, he's like genuinely one of the smartest guys. He can make a silly amount of money. Yeah. Um, he's now taken over lead gen as a whole from a cold email standpoint. And I'm on calls with growth partners and like I let him speak because yeah. I'm out of touch and I don't want to be standing there. Like he gave, we gave the recorder as well, like he's been using AI in, <coughs> in this. And now I think AI for the most part is kind of a bit of BS, but the way he did it is just like, he did like hours and hours and hours and hours of like detailed hard research in like 10 minutes. And I would have never done that. So he's created mm -hmm. and solved inefficiencies, mm -hmm. which is how, because like if you do cold email now, like it's super saturated. Instantly, and the fact that you can send hundreds of thousands of emails mm -hmm. for free at scale, mm -hmm. basically means that everyone is doing it. So before where you could get like 5% positive reply rates and just make silly money, it doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. What he's done is bringing that back. And we are printing our cold email. Mm. Like, it's incredible when you apply AI in the right way with like the targeting and it comes, it, the copy doesn't matter anymore, it's like 20%. It's all about the tar targeting and relevancy. And by applying it in the right way, and he literally did like a full funnel of AI to like break down offers into pain points, the sub niches, the sub sub niches, right. to the most relevant thing. And it's market message resonance more than anything else. Because most people are just sending to like industries or, or keywords. Dude, this is what I'm kind of realizing. As it's not so much like I think we've all been kind of sold on ta marketing tactics over time. Because like majority of the make money online space is marketing. run run by marketers. <laughs> yes. So like Unique mechanisms. Yeah, it's marketers selling marketing to aspiring marketers. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah. But to be fair, like what I'm kind of understanding over time is that most of those things are mostly irrelevant. Yeah. Relevance and actually speaking to to your demographic, like on what's currently relevant to them is the most important thing. It's, it's, it's the, it, do you know what's the most interesting thing for me jumping into calls and being in the product more and more is actually the qualitative feedback that is more important, important than the quantitative numbers I'm getting from ads. So I made the biggest jumps by the qualitative insights I'm getting from being on sales course, from being mm. coaching people. And I used to think it's all about the numbers. Yeah. But it's, it's genuinely not. Like that doesn't actually matter anywhere near as much. And this is something I'm super passionate about is like the marketing tactics for marketing sake. And I'm trying to remove more and more of that, especially because we sell to marketers. Right. So if you sell marketing to marketers and they go on and like, this guy's marketing to me, Right. The and first thing they think is fuck off. <laughs> right. Exactly. The other thing too is like going back to that example of um, that in-person like filming offer. Um, the reason that worked for me, for example, is not because like the offer like they they were they were talking about like oh we're gonna get you this this and this result. I didn't even fucking care to be honest. Because for me, all I cared about was putting content out there. Like that's like mm -hmm. I want that's something I like to do. But I, I just don't have the infrastructure or the time or the bandwidth to do it. Like, that's my biggest thing, right? Now, if I grow to 10K on TikTok or 100K on TikTok or on this, whatever, man, I don't give a shit. Like, generally speaking, I, I don't care. Like, but it's like, because it was relevant to me, right? Cause like I got all these pitches. Oh, we'll do short form. We'll do content and blah blah. Okay, but I still gotta sit down on my fucking yeah. computer and film this I, shit. I think the most important thing around marketing now is actually figuring out the single most relevant person to put your message in front of, rather than yes. coming up with the best offer, the best guarantee. For sure. That it's just finding the one subset of a subset that actually hits and getting it in front of them. No, a hundred percent, man. But again, this goes back to what I was saying. In order to do that, what do you need? You need to know your market. The biggest thing. People don't know. It's hilarious how little time people put into market research. Like you will do well because you truly understand your market so, so well. 
That's why I'd never tell you to switch. And you genuinely know more than most people in your space. It, it, it's true, honestly, like, uh, that's a huge selling point for me is, and, and this is actually, here's some free game. This, if you want to get really, really good on sales, you need to be the conduit of truth for your niche. So I'll, I'll give a better example of what I mean by this. When I go and I talk to founders of SaaS companies, they're usually pretty smart guys. They're pretty sophisticated. They've, they've come from good universities. They're probably, they've worked at Fang or other big companies, other big tech companies. They have good resume, good experience. They're sharp guys. They probably have a couple million dollars in venture capital behind them. They're like sophisticated guys. You can't bullshit them. They're smart people. Um, what I have found is like being the most useful thing besides the flowchart framework I've told you in the case studies is, is being the conduit of truth. So what I do is I go and I look at the influencers of who they should be following. So, uh, you know, thought leaders, which is a terrible term, in venture capital, um, uh, who else do I, uh, the All In podcast. So if you guys know, um, i trying to think of who's the, uh, Who's like the Bangladesh dude who was at Facebook? He was like the head of product. Now he's a billionaire. Um, you guys will recognize him if you see him, but like the All In podcast, famous podcast, has a bunch of billionaires, David Sachs and uh, something Kalamakis and all, all these other guys, right? And so those guys basically have a podcast similar to this where they sit around once a week on Zoom uh, and they just talk about current events going on in the world of tech, how uh, you know geopolitics is influencing things, how the economy, like macroeconomic trends, just all, all these things going on in tech. So as I consume that content, as I'm like reading these bulletins, follow, following the, the thought leaders of my niche on Twitter, stuff like that, I'm just picking up these insights. And I, I even actually am imp implementing something within the my business where uh, once a week, everyone in the company will just get together for 30 minutes and we're just gonna go through what we learned this week uh, following these, like following these uh, thought leaders and these influencers, how it uh, affects our clients because then I'll be talking on sales calls and I'll be talking, they'll be you know, complaining about, uh, oh, well, you know, we're experiencing a slowdown. And I can say, well, actually, uh, right now there's a, a increase of sales cycle about 25% in enterprise sales. They didn't know that. How do I know that? Oh, I was, uh, you know, and then I can quote the venture capital that I came from. Oh, that's really, and they'll, they'll know who it is. Yeah. That's really interesting. Or I can, you know, speak about certain trends within AI and, and how, it, you know, all these big companies are now uh, reassessing acquisitions and, and I can talk to them about these acquisitions. Just the fact that you have so much deep insight into what their pain points are, like the stuff that they should be doing, but they don't have the time to research and you're and you're the conduit of truth. Like when I say that stuff to them, they don't think about it coming from the venture capital guy or from the all in podcast. They think about it coming from Jake yeah. and it just places you as a huge so authority figure. You need to be driving your clients forward you need to be leading them yeah. rather than them coming to you yeah and what you're doing which most people don't do is you're going deeper and deeper mm -hmm. most people aren't willing to do that level of work and i think uh, a second point of this is like one of the best marketing tactics of all time is just to tell the truth mm -hmm. so you know if you can be honest and the reason why it works so well is that most people aren't honest yeah is the honest answer just just the position like Contrast is everything, man. Like, this is something I've understood. Like, I have such a good story about this. Like, I was at this uh, really good hotel in Lisbon recently. And, you know, there was one day I went to the gym and I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. And like, I come back to the hotel and I'm drenched in sweat. I'm looking horrible. Like, I, I, I pull up to the restaurant, right? And I order my food and I get... I'm, I'm, everybody in that hotel looks like really good, you know, well-dressed. And I get in there, shorts, like sweating. fucking <laughs> sweating like a maniac. But I get in there, first off, I order like the most expensive stuff, which I usually do at the restaurants. But then I treat the staff really well. And at the end, I tip really well, right? And then the next day, um, I come back, I'm well-dressed now. But like the, the restaurant was supposedly already closed, right? But I, I, I'm approaching to see like, um, like if it's closed or open, like I didn't know. But the, I didn't even say anything. The manager approaches me that I spoke with yesterday. He approaches me and he's like, listen, we close at 3. It's like 3.10. We close at 3, but for you, we'll make an, an exception. And he brings me to the table. I don't even have to say anything. Just brings me all the food and stuff like that. 
and like and then still treat the, the, the staff really well and by the end everybody loves me right because like i'm just the the day before i came in as like the most average joe mm. and and then you have all these other people like dress really well like playing to appear high status and stuff and then like i get in there average joe like looking like absolute garbage but i treat everybody really well and i'm actually like i'm displaying actual high status because of the things i'm consuming the way i'm treating people right so essentially like by creating that contrast right it's the same thing with marketing and, and business like when everybody's like going left if you go right like yeah. you just stand out automatically yeah. you know it's the, it's that just like uh brute the force is really good at this yeah like you have a standard set of ideals in self-improvement business etc and like these are the things that everybody preaches right you need to do your cold showers uber you, types. Yeah, yeah the uber types exactly and then you got this guy <clears throat> rugged looking yeah. fucking has the most raspy voice every time he opens his mouth like th that's the first juxtaposition like this guy looks like a he doesn't look like he's articulate. Like, yeah. he looks like a brute, literally. Yeah. But then he opens his mouth, he starts speaking, and you're like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. who is this guy? Yeah. Okay, he's the, the, the source. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, he's the source, right? And then, on top of that, everything this guy preaches, most of it goes against, like, yeah. what what is, like, the best Practice. industry practices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then, like, you end up with with what it is which is this guy turns on a space you have a thousand people listening in yeah. one minute yeah, like many exactly so it's kind of like now he's a great example but he can only pull that off because he's jacked and he's like he has good proof behind him right like like oh, playing like putting down a lot of money he's right jacked the shit like because you've seen other guys try to pull off the brute thing and they're like scrawny and tiny necks and, it's and it's stuff like that and nobody pays attention it's like like Tate did it very well yeah, as well. Like, it's, it's, well. It's the same kind of thing. And I think that the problem now is that so many people are like 20 thinking they have the world of information to share. And actually at that age, you know yeah. nothing and that you're better off just learning. And like you said, if you want to share your journey, go for it. But don't pretend that you're better than you are because you want to, you have an <clears> ego and you need to I, I think that's the biggest thing, even with content. This is something I noticed because like, you know, I would say, like, I'm not fucking brute to force, but I have a certain level of influence in our space. Like, when I say something, people listen, mm -hmm. essentially. Like, because, and this has been created by me over time, saying things that people have found useful. Yeah. Uh, and saying them from a perspective of, I'm not here to preach to you or to tell you that my way is the right way. Mm -hmm. I'm here to tell you, like, this is what I've done and this is the results that have occurred because of this. And I think people are kind of like almost tired of like that positioning of like, yeah, like all of this is trash and this is yeah. the, the good way to do but it. And let me say though, because I have this with the agency and growth partner thing. Yeah. Okay. So like we've all said here, we don't like agencies. Agencies are terrible. We wouldn't work with them. Great partner, blah, 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 blah. Sure. You do the same thing with yours. You're like, low ticket is trash. You go no, yeah, there. it goes back to the contrast, but I'm uh, what I'm saying is that's important in marketing, right? The juxtaposition is important mm -hmm. in marketing, but it's also important to not come from that perspective of like, I know all, I'm, I'm the end, yes. all, end all be all, you know? Like, you know what I think would be a really compelling angle if someone wanted to sell a course is like the come with me. Like I, I'm gonna start out on this journey. You should come join my community, and and I think that's, you. I, that's the that's the KC model. Yeah, um, basically. That's what they did. Kill crew. You know how they started Kill crew? No idea. So essentially, they said that we're gonna build this. Yeah. Right. We're gonna to join the group. We're, we're we're gonna yeah. build this, and uh, you guys will get to see all of it. Yeah. And the the money the first ads that Kill crew ever run were paid by. The initial subscriptions to yeah, the, it was the like, private Discord. You had to buy like a private group to yeah. join and then exactly. watch them build it. But, but very few people do it. I think it's a good angle. Because most people can't do it. Yeah, most people can't do it. Yeah, no. It's really so so the, the reason the reason Kill Crew work is because they already had built stores before. 
yeah, like brands. They, they, they were experienced. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, so, so this is something that I say in with the growth partners is that actually it's like, it's so hard to take from zero to one yeah that is like not even worth it but going from one to ten is actually just pulling on a full a few levers and i learned this from homozi and he articulates it well with what he does is that the reason he works with companies at one to three million is they've got off the ground they've normally got product market fit but they don't know how to run the business properly so he comes in there's a few things that they've done time and time again and they can get to like 10 20 million just like that he basically does private equity, except he's a skilled operator. Yeah, which, yeah. Right, which yeah. Like, is the same principle that we're taking. Is like, if you have skills, if you've been somewhat successful, but you don't really know how to get to where you want to be, yeah. like we can teach you how to apply it in the in a way, in a logical like pathway that works for you to get results and your clients. Honestly, I think that's the end goal, man. The end goal. Unless you're gonna build like this huge enterprise with like huge exit value, private equity is the end goal. Of course. And everything. Yeah. Yeah. And honestly, like um, you talking about like, we, earlier we spoke of, uh, I wouldn't buy anything. Like there's no course out there. There's nothing that compelling to me. I would do the Dan Pena QLA, partly because I just think it would be interesting to do. And I, I don't know how many more years the guy has in him. But uh, I like, uh, I was telling you, earlier about my uh, my best friend and I that were in business, we actually looked into doing a roll up. Tougher in Canada due to like the business development banks and the structure of the loan types there than it is in the US with the SBA loans. But doing leverage buyout roll ups is really interesting. I also wanted to make sure that I had the skill set before, like going and taking a $2 million loan when, when you can't even, you know, scale a business to 100,000 or something like that. I think that's a natural progression. 100%. Like you build these businesses, like you acquire all this these skill sets, and then you acquire businesses. By the time we're the result, like the uh, SMMA courses that are now rampant, it'll all be private equity courses uh, from, from, from guys in our space, man. It'll be guys dude, but guys. but actually, that's a fair point. Like, if I would buy some, if I would buy something, <coughs> I would buy it from like the like those really like OGs, because like 100%. I think people are very obsessed with new business. I think old business is like. I think there's a lot of things to take away from old business. Those guys you know? clean up. Those guys yeah. like, it, like the, the unsexy business. Well, actually, you know, as we talk about kind of the private equity model, do you know Cody Sanchez? I think that's her name. She, uh, she like, do you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. She's, uh, I think like her whole thing is like buying boring businesses, right? Like that's yeah. like, I think her whole shtick on Instagram and it's like buying laundromats and stuff like that. It's a very small scale version of private equity, yeah. but that's like a really smart model and it so is. i think you're going to start to see more emergence of that no, and i think um i think it's just like if if you have the skill set mm-hmm. and you have something that already works is already validated mm-hmm. again you can just get in there like make a few like key changes yeah. boom like everything goes up especially yeah. jacob i think you would agree when you talk to most of these businesses Sales process is broken. Marketing oh. process is broken. Oh, this client oh. relation process is yeah. broken. Like leadership, like the, the the room to increase the value on these things is so all, massive. Our biggest client is two hundred fifty million a year. Yeah, we mentioned that. Yeah, they don't track the sales calls. Yeah. They don't record the sales calls. Yeah. They don't like check what the sales reps are saying. Yeah. they don't have a way to get leads coming in. They don't have like an ops process. Yeah. Like, it's just uh, mad. Can you disclose what they sell, or is that private? It's trained. It's education. So we oh. we do old school education, like universities, like and business stuff like that. Yeah, that, right? yeah. So like training courses. So like like before Infra Product, there was like regulated training, and that's what we sell. Oh, interesting. Is it that's usually like leadership training or something like that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I won't disclose big, specifically big enterprises, there. right? Yeah. Like those yeah. huge enterprise packages. Yeah. yeah. So they they work right. with like all the big banks. That they work with Dubai, right, right, the Saudis. Right, right. Dude, like they ESG make so when, so when we make a sale for them <laughs> with like five ten percent commission, it's like so like the money we bring in a month, we don't really disclose the performance because what happens in B two B, which no one talks about, which is the biggest pain in the ass, performance fees take so long to come in. Oh yeah, because yeah. it's like the deals are not quick. Yeah, it's like, and this is why again I think there's such a fallacy with agencies is that like, oh you're on three month contracts, great, well. B2B deals take on average three months. So unless you have a set up on day one, the chances are they're not really closing by month three. Yeah. So yes, if you've had a lot of forward momentum, you've got some quick wins, they may stay with I'll you. Right. But ultimately, if they- I'm gonna take this position on 
Camera, there we go. <laughs> but so like ultimately, I can't remember what I was saying there. Ultimately, after three months, you haven't got the results. So then they leave. Mm-hmm. So then you start again. But that's why I'm such a big fan of longer contracts and why yeah. I don't particularly like the setup is that yes, if you can do three months and <clears throat> smash out the pile and get paid like 50 grand for doing it, <coughs> like that's a lot of money, it's good. Yeah. But the, the amount you have to, you have to keep going through that to make that kind of money. And again, it's good money. But if you can find a few clients, go really deep with them. Like we'll, we've got like 11 clients now. We can make probably like 400K a month just from those clients. That's really good. Once, because the performance of some of them has like, it's not even kicked in yet. The, the compelling point to the setup, as, as we'll call it, right? Like the quick rapid deploy is just the fact that it's, for, for guys that are in the agency space, or if you are like me and you have years of outbound experience, you know the systems really well, you know the infrastructure really well. Uh, and if you can figure out the paid ads, again, uh, be, like generally the, you're trying to hit like a 30% uh, acquisition cost relative to your LTV and SaaS. That's like a really healthy number. You can go higher than that, but that's a healthy number. If you can figure out and deploy that quickly, um, the value for the business is so tremendous. And if you can get out, if you can like deploy it and get out, it's really, really compelling just from an agency. Cause, cause you're not having to like suffer through the pains and I get it. You don't have to do so as much, much ops. You have to do as much client delivery yeah. and management. And exactly. And like, sit down and I, oh, I do I get yeah. the attraction, but I also see the pitfalls. hundred percent. And I think yeah. like where I'm more tempted for, <coughs> for that specific yeah. model, which is um, more of like a growth consultation model with a setup, yeah. which is hilarious. Um, but it's essentially like, if you're gonna do a setup, keep them on for 12 months on a good retainer, where you just keep telling them, cause you can provide so much value to the company, not yeah. just marketing and sales. So like, if you can, and, and again, this doesn't work for everyone. Mm-hmm. This only works for people who actually have the experience in growing business Agreed. and skills Agreed. and stuff like that. But if you can give a three month setup and then nine months on a consultation package, yeah. where you are telling them, okay, do this test, this test, this test, okay, change this process, yeah. do this. like. That's a really attractive model that you can make a lot of money with without the ops while being able to actually get them better results, collect better case studies because you have yeah. a longer time with them. That's where I would be moving to if that was my offer rather than just the setup. I think also one of the things is uh, it's probably more valuable for companies to start to bring stuff in house. Like naturally, they're going to have to start to hire talent because when it, you know, when it comes time to series A or, or raising the next yeah. round or whatever it is, the first thing they're gonna say is, okay, let's see the team. What's their track record? What's their experience? Show me the head of marketing or the or who's who's generating leads. Like they're, it, they're not gonna want it to be an agency. They're gonna want people in the seats. Yeah. Where I do think that there's value is letting them hire real people and then you kind of acting as a fractional consultant. So there, there's, I don't know, I, I probably have that's, to tweak the- That's again, the same thing is like, the way I'd sell that is like during the next nine months, what we'll do is we're gonna, I'll train yeah. someone in your team internally yeah. to manage it. Yeah. With the growth partner, to counter what you're saying though, the growth partner model, cause you're not taking equity and our expenses can be dissolved at exit. They can, we can help someone get to the point of exit without actually like it negatively impacting the exit price, mm-hmm. which is why it works. But so some people, <coughs> might want to take a slice of the equity and i get why for me it's like get your cash now when you guys are young make the cash so you can eventually go do what you want to do for Mm -hmm. example but i think that the honest thing with the equity is it's gonna the people who are actually going to give you equity at the beginning they're not going to be good businesses agreed yeah so it's like take the revenue share don't worry about the exit get your money now use the skills that you've learned to go and build a better business, which is the second one. Because the first business you build is gonna be crap. My agency was crap. Yeah. When I look at it, like yeah. I don't get me wrong, I made more money than most people will like make per month, and I'm very proud of that, but it was a crap business. Sure. I was just I'm just talented. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um this growth partner business is much better. But like Alex Becker is still one of the guys that I look up to in the space and think like he's done it the best like when i look I at agree. it hcom made tens of millions mm-hmm. um high rose just sold for 100 million his other one was iron mastermind like he used that money to fund 
Um, yeah, Harold. Uh, but he did like HCOM with like six team members. He did Iron with like two team members. They each each single one of them made like ten million plus, ten million plus. Like HCOM itself was one point four mil a month. Okay, it's really good. A, a three thousand pound product, I think it was three thousand dollars. That's what, what does it say? Um, dropshipping essentially. Yeah. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. sells a three thousand dollar dropship of course. He used to. He used okay. to. He stopped. And it does one. Oh, it did. It's like one point two, one point four. Yeah. Um, was it was it paid ads or was it paid ads? Paid ads. Yeah. Like and, and it wasn't even his. Like he never did the dropshipping. <clears throat> he just partnered with someone. Yes. Original yes. growth partner. <laughs> it's like, oh, good for him. Um, and like he preaches as well. Like your first business is going to be a piece of crap, so don't worry about it. Just use that to get money to then go build the next business. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's actually what's important. So like we're going to iterate FE Grow Partner and the Grow Partner multiple times. And yep. it, his journey with HCOM was like, he got to 200K a month. Then he was like, okay, this is like stagnant for a few months. Rebuilt the offer, rebuilt the marketing, rebuilt the sales process. Bam, 700K a month. Same thing, stagnant for a few months. Lasted a little bit longer, but stagnant. Okay, we did it again, we did yeah. it again. Boom, 1.2, 1.4 million. Then, yeah, this this where we're at now, essentially. Like um, we just had this, you know, our biggest month, four hundred k. Now we're like, it's. I think it, it always happens like this. Like we were kind of stuck, yeah. Like quote unquote on two hundred k a month. You know, sometimes it would be higher, yeah. like two fifty. Sometimes it will be a little bit lower, but it will would always fluctuate like that. And basically, essentially, we went into what I call development mode. Yep. Yeah. Which is not you're not growing, but you're developing this stuff In, internally. The product. Yeah, the business, exactly. The product is the business, but people think sales and marketing is the business. Right, yeah. exactly. So, and then <coughs> after like a few months of doing that, boom, like huge upswing. Yeah. Now, same thing. Like, you're prob- we're probably going to fluctuate in the 300s, 300 something. Yeah. If we're going to stay there for a little bit. We're going to develop, right? Because things kind of broke, <laughs> to be completely transparent, yeah. uh, a little bit. So now we're back in development mode. I like that you said that because most people aren't honest enough to say mm-hmm. things. Right. No, but it's the truth. Like you, yeah. you, like you can't scale past a capacity that you were at before without things breaking. It's kind of like if you look at the human body and you go to the gym and you did a weight that you've never d- done before, you're going to m- break muscle fibers that you never broke yeah. before. And you're going to be s- more sore than you were ever before. Like that's just how it works. So for us... Like things kind of broke, we're gonna we're gonna we're kind of gonna fluctuate there for a little bit. We're gonna go back into development mode, um, you know, build the things that we need to build on the front end and the back end, right? And then we're gonna do a hard push again, yeah. and then it's gonna be our next greatest month. And it should, I think, this is just the natural progression of things. Like, and you need to add more people, you need to hire more 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 stuff. Like, but essentially, that's the like your. First, this is shouldn't be even. I shouldn't have to say it, but I think a lot of people like they start a business, and if they have this idea that the business is gonna hit the peak or gonna be at its best, like in the first six months, which is silly. You're like, still stupid. You're right. Twelve months in, you're still just figuring it out. Yeah, exactly. which is why I'm like super impressed by what you've done. Like, it's fantastic how quickly you've grown. And no, if, for sure. If, if especially, or I didn't realize it was organic, which is even more impressive. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's our selling point, you know, like uh, whatever, if, if we ever venture out to, to another thing, it's like... When you want Twitter ads, hit me up, I'll help you out. <laughs> yeah. Like f- f- for us, it's kind of like, but that's because like our prediction, kind of the industry and where it's going is that obviously paid ads are always going to work, always like, but ads are content, if you think about it, like at the core, like you're creating content. So for us... We would rather like create content that is gonna like compound because ads don't compound, right? right? Yeah. You have to pour more money into them yeah. for them to c- continue working. With content, like our mindset is, is always like, fuck the ads, right? We're just gonna keep compounding the content over and over and over again, compounding the audience over and over again. And like that might be a slower growth rate, which it will be. Clearly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, might be, right? Then, like, if, if we were running ads too, might be a slower growth rate, but, like, it's gonna, it's gonna be more exponential over time. Like, this is our prediction, like, and we're gonna stick to it, and we're gonna see how far we can go. Fantastic. Uh, and and the, the thing is, 
Cause, cause like in the future, right? Like we're the guys that are daring to do something that most people would not dare to do, which is to like try to scale like an organic organic marketing strategy to the point where like nobody is that nobody's ever gone to before. Like this is like our where our minds are at, and we might be able to pull it off. We might not, but if we do pull it off, the leverage that we're gonna acquire from that in terms of like. Oh. We've done this, right? Yeah. We've we're the, the we're like nobody else has ever done something like this before. Like the leverage we're gonna acquire from that, like if we ever m- want to make a pivot, is like they're gonna make. That's the that's yeah. a true unique selling point. That, you yeah, know. Yeah. What do you uh, prefer? I mean, if you're willing to speak about it, what do you, do you prefer uh, selling info products or service? Um, so I'm allowed to be a marketer and the growth partner which I am by nature a yeah. true marketer. Like that, like I wouldn't classify myself as a CEO. Jordan is more of the CEO. Like he mm-hmm. wants to manage people. He wants to deal with relationships. Fuck people, fuck relationships. I want to market. Yeah. That's just yeah. like my natural tendency, yeah, yeah. okay? So I enjoy the growth partner because I get to experiment and run marketing. With FE Growth Partner, we don't even need to market. We have so many people coming to us to work with us that, I, that we don't even send cold emails right. for ourselves because we don't want to take on more people. So from an enjoyment standpoint, I like the fact that I can run ads. I like the fact that I can be creative, like do the VSL it actually matters. Where on FE, because it's services, like it's also different doing it for yourself and doing it for clients. It's the honest truth. Mm-hmm. It's always better to do stuff for yourself. 100%. So I enjoy it out more, the growth partner, but I also recognize the fact that I would never be able to be here without yeah. the hard work that I've done. Um, but my tendency is to build a market, yeah, and that's what I want to. Do. Yeah, I feel I feel the same. Like there's definitely just some, like there's, I can just feel like there's something missing. I, I I love the clients I work for. I love the exposure. I'm doing it for the exposure. Right, they won't see this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but no, like I, I generally like I like to have like the whole the whole point of my current plan or, or where I'm at in it all is that I get broad exposure to a variety of industries, selling to you know different company sizes uh, at different stages, whether it's helping to solve market message resonance, product market fit, whatever. The idea is that I become really skilled. I have a good track record. I can use that to raise money and again, follow the VC or the yeah. private equity I mean, that's, model, yeah, right? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. There's still always something that is a little bit missing. I hope that I'm able to kind of scratch that itch uh, this summer. I'll probably like go deeper on building my own stuff for deal flow or like my own personal brand, whatever it is, uh, and kind of scratch the edge there. But yeah, you definitely feel like- So like the reason I like it is- Like it's not investing. When it's your own stuff, you can yeah. just say whatever the fuck you want. Yeah. Like obviously within reason, don't yeah, do yeah, yeah. making crazy claims. Right. But like you can be as creative as possible. And I think that <clears throat> again, it's why I don't think working with like multiple, like tens, dozens of clients makes sense. Could you lose the creative spark when you're trying to do it at scale? But if you just have one client or two clients or your, yourself, you can be so much more creative and you'll get, like, you'll win. Like what you were saying about building case study sales letters, which we've done, and I'm now gonna go steal and write case study sales letters of all of our case studies. Mm. Like, imagine doing that for every client. Right. It'd be, it'd be impossible. Yes. But for a sales, writing a 50 page doc makes sense because of the ROI that comes to you. Yep. But if it's for clients and you only get 5% or 5 grand or 10 grand a month, it's just not even worth it. Because, like, I, I'm at a point now, like, you know, I'm not fucking you know, one of the richest people in, in the world by, by, by any means. But I, I have enough money to the point where, like, I can't be bothered to do things that I don't want to necessarily do that's the and what i mean by that opinion. is not necessarily like i'll do those things for my business and for like the thing that i work on but like for myself or like for for like let's say client work i can't be fucking bothered because like I don't, I don't need that you know <laughs> yeah and i think the that is the whole point of growing a business is to have the freedom to do and choose to do what you want so as you scale, like 
if you're working with clients that you don't love, you don't love their business, you don't love their offer, maybe they're not ethical, maybe they just don't have an impact and it's just there for money, you know, whatever that reason is, like you don't have the same drive and motivation. Like I can work 13, 14 hour days, no problem whatsoever without being tired. Yep. Which like, I used to think it was a flex when I used to do it, but I used to have to do it. But right. now I genuinely love working so much that like, it doesn't phase me yeah, if I've got to do that. Like a hundred percent, like I feel like uh, a lot of people they think I'm weird because uh, like I work all the time. Essentially, I'm always <laughs> I'm always working and I'm always on vacation. Essentially, which is hilarious. Uh, but work is play for me, man. Like yeah, I think it's a game. I, you know, sometimes I'll uh, I'll do a little bit of indulgence on whatever vice it is. We all have our vices. Like I'll go on a fucking six hour video game spree with my homies. Or some, I'll going out like like this to do this shit all day, but but like I'll do that. But soon after, like I'm just like, man, yeah. this is cool, but it doesn't hit as much, you know. Yeah. Um. So I mean, running and and that's the thing, man, because like running the business and actively like changing your life in real time, that's like, I mean, what what else? Is better than that like truthfully if you if you truly think about it like no, this is what, the, what else what else are you gonna do this is the ultimate game when you yeah. when you when you set yourself up where you live basically you live your perfect day over and over again and that's the point in running a business it's like if you just live a day that you enjoy time and time and time again you'll never burn out you always make more money you always stay focused and actually this is where I think most people go wrong in the space is that when they get successful that you right. they start to deviate from what got them there in the first place and then they wipe themselves out of the game yeah. but actually the people who win like the alex Moses, just play the game for so long and continue to play it that it's impossible for them to fail so your strategy of just going organic and going super deep basically makes it impossible for you to fail in the long run exactly like even for me like when I'm building these businesses and stuff like that, and, I, and I'm just working, like sometimes like there's the ups and downs, right? Like there's that variance, like things will go wrong inevitably. Like, as I was saying, this month is not being as good as the last one. And like for some brief moments that can be like, oh, like you get angry or frustrated or whatever the fuck, right? But like ultimately, um, dude, at the end of the day, right? Like, I've come to a point in Brooke as well. Like, we really don't care. Like, we got enough money to the point where, like, we don't, we can't, like, the money's just not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Um, but what we do care about is wiping the floor with everybody. <laughs> that's what we care about. So it's kind of like, um, that's what drives us now. Like, I posted the other day, like, sometimes I find it hilarious because, cause, like, you'll have people message Brooke, right? Saying, like, clear, like, people that are looking to copy whatever it is that we're doing, right? They'll message Brooke, hey, Brooke, like, how how have you built your personal brand? And, like, what's your strategy and blah, blah, blah. It's kind of like, bro, like, don't try to get friendly because we're, we're trying to fucking wipe the floor yeah. with all of you, you know? And, and besides the competition aspect, it's just, like... I think both me and Brooke, we have that gaming mindset where it's kind of like, if you give us an infinite game to play, yeah, we're gonna play it yeah. infinitely, you know. And and I think that's where, I think that's also one of the reasons why we are both really one good business partners. Because one thing about business partners, man, like you can never feel like one of the people in that partnership is pulling the most weight. Mm -hmm. Like you can never feel that. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you're gonna grow resentful yeah. and it's just gonna be bad all around. But like we both pull weight, right? Obviously there's oscillations where there's seasons where I'm pulling more weight, he's pulling less weight. And that's why vice versa. Right, but, but like the thing is, both of us like just have this obsession with just building better and mm -hmm. doing better yeah. and being 
Like, and, and that's what motivates us. And that's why we, we enjoy playing. The profits are obviously nice, yeah. right? I'm not going to say otherwise. But the thing is now is that like, because me and Jordan, like we talk about the same thing. And yeah. like, it's interesting to hear you say it because it, it's probably a lot of other people that feel the same way. And exactly. Like I now have all the things that I could possibly want. Like buying another pair of shoes or whatever it doesn't do anything. You want to know something else, man? <laughs> once you like, once you, once you're on the come up, like you get fascinated by all these things. Mm -hmm. But once you see past the veil, dude. Like again, I'm not saying this, but but like I've, for example, women in my life. I've I've because of my success in the last year. I've had access to certain <coughs> types of women that I wouldn't otherwise have access sure. to. I've been I've been with these women, like, you know, not in relationships, but you know what I'm saying, right? And I've been in the nice hotels, yeah. And I've eaten the nice, eaten the nice food, and I fucking, I basically like I've experienced most of this stuff that did used to fascinate me. I've experienced it. And now it's just like, I've seen past the curtain and honestly, I'm not impressed, you know? hundred percent. And that's the thing, man. Like I, I, these, these, these models or whatever you want to call it, right? These, these really hot chicks, like I'm with these people and I'm just like, I'm just not impressed. Like I'll, I'll sit with a guy who has like, a, like supposedly like a, a great life and he flexes a lot on Instagram and then he opens his, his mouth and I'm just like, I'm not impressed. Like, I'm just not. There's an action Bronson song about that. It, it's, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Three Michelin stars, I'm still not impressed. <laughs> but that's the thing, like, once like, you it, see past the curtain, yeah. once the veil gets lifted, <clears throat> and you realize, oh, like, this shit is not impressive at all. Like, you just go back to the basics, you know, go back to your roots. And it's kind of like, this is where I'm at now. Like, I've experienced all these things. They were cool, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but like, Dude, just whatever, just another day. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So now all that's left to do is just go back to work. Yeah. It's just go back to doing back what to, I love, which is to basics. play the game. Yeah. You know? We need to shoot. This song goes me. That was a good session, Jen.